Good evening. Chris Hayes has, has a well-deserved night off, so this is a special edition of Inside with Jen Psaki. The biggest danger to the world in 2024 is Donald Trump. Not war, not a pandemic, not climate change. The former president and leading Republican candidate. He's the biggest danger. And don't take my word for it. I've said versions of this before. That's according to The Economist. In recent days, the former president elevated a call to arrest the judge and prosecutor in his New York fraud case, vowed to put his perceived enemies in a mental institution, and compared his political opponents to, quote, vermin. And what is really frightening is that his language is clearly intentional. On Saturday afternoon, Donald Trump posted this Veterans Day message, pledging to, quote, root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. That was a post, a written post. He then repeated that fascist rhetoric, echoing Adolf Hitler, in front of the crowd gathered at his New Hampshire rally. This wasn't off the cuff. He planned to deliver those words as part of his big finale in his closing argument of that speech. And Trump's campaign spokesperson defended the language, saying that the, quote, sad, miserable existence of those who criticize it will be crushed when President Trump returns to the White House. That is not backing off of it, just in case you're wondering. So this wasn't a gaffe. This wasn't some crazy Donald Trump rambling rift at the end of a speech. It is his message, and it is his plan. According to recent Washington Post reporting, quote, Donald Trump and his allies have begun mapping out specific plans for using the federal government to punish critics and opponents should he win a second term. With the former president naming individuals he wants to investigate or prosecute and his associates drafting plans to potentially invoke the Insurrection Act on his first day in office to allow him to deploy the military against civil demonstrations. That's what they're planning. Donald Trump has always been an authoritarian at heart. He loves dictators and authoritarian leaders. In fact, even just today, just a few hours ago, a judge in Colorado just ruled that he did indeed incite insurrection on January 6th. But he is allowed to remain on the ballot in that state. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show. But Republicans have always overlooked the dangerous rhetoric and used him to meet their ends. They figured, we'll use him. They passed tax cuts that benefited the ultra-wealthy, something they'd been wanting to do. They stacked the Supreme Court and the lower courts with conservative judges. And of course, that conservative majority on the court then struck down Roe v. Wade, as we all know. These priorities were so important to Republicans that they were willing to look the other way. The problem is, they created a monster that they can't stop. And lots of Republicans are deciding they kind of like the way the monster does things. Right now, we're watching more and more Republicans embrace those anti-democratic values. Opinion columnist Jamel Bowie explains in the New York Times earlier today, quote, to many Republicans, persuasion is anathema. There is no use making an argument since you might lose. Instead, the game is to create a system in which heads or tails, you always win. I'm going to talk to Jamel later about that in the show. Um, and his point is key to understanding the current Republican Party and what their motivation is according their new speaker, Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Now, at first blush, it may not seem like he has much in common with Donald Trump. After all, the speaker is a deeply religious conservative in a covenant marriage with a pension for nerdy glasses as well. And Donald Trump as well, Donald Trump. But if you listen carefully to Speaker Johnson, you may hear some familiar themes. The only question is, is God going to allow our nation to enter a time of judgment for our collective sins, which his mercy and grace have held back for some time? Or is he going to give us one more chance to restore the foundations and return to him? We will not be able to do it without the Lord's help because it, there's so the flesh is and the mistrust and the, the sin and everything is so great here that we this is going to have to bring people to their knees. And I, look, I, I believe God is about to do something. See, Mike Johnson and Donald Trump, the leaders of the Republican Party, both talk about America as this very dark place that needs to be purged of sin, in Johnson's words, or purged of vermin, if you're talking in Donald Trump's words. But those words are really catch-alls for anyone who challenges their view of the world, anyone defending the rights of women to have an abortion, or anyone in the LGBTQ community, or immigrants, really anyone who doesn't look like them, or vote for them, or believe what they do doesn't matter that Donald Trump sees this through the prism of self-preservation, and Mike Johnson, I guess, sees it as his biblical calling. Their goals are the same, to root out dissent, 
and the other, any other. It all has the makings of basically an authoritarian meet zealot buddy movie that really no one needs in this country. And if Donald Trump is elected next year, these two men would basically be running the country. So what can we do to stop that from happening? How can Democrats make the argument that Trump and Johnson's anti-democratic vision of America is not the way forward? We've been following breaking news out of Colorado, where a judge ruled against an attempt to keep Donald Trump off the ballot in 2024. This is not the first time the judge has ruled this way, but in this ruling, the judge found, quote, that the court finds that petitioners have established that Trump engaged in an insurrection on January 6, 2021, through incitement, and that the First Amendment does not protect Trump's speech. We're all trying to make sense of this. But joining me now is someone who can help us do that, Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. Well, Secretary Griswold, thank you so much for joining us. I've been trying to I've been reading all the clips and I've been trying to make sense of what this all means. So let me start by just asking you what your reaction is to the ruling and what this means in Colorado. Well, I, I think first off, having the court say that the former president engaged in insurrection is big news for the entire country. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump is a danger to American democracy, and, and that's something that's really novel about that, this case, that the judge decided that. Uh, but ultimately, she has ordered me to put him on the ballot, uh, and I will, of course, follow whatever court order is in place by the time I certify the ballot. The judge found and this is what's so interesting because it does it is significant. I'm not a lawyer, but that the judge did say he was involved in the insurrection, as you just said. The judge also found that Trump as president was not an officer of the United States. Uh, did, did that surprise you? Honestly, yes. The idea that if you're a soldier or a congressperson, a U.S. senator, that if you engage in insurrection, you can't be qualified to sit in office again. But the U.S. president can engage in insurrection and then be present, president again, uh, I think is a, a, a potentially dangerous precedent. Uh, the presidency is the most powerful office in this nation. And that I, the idea that the U.S. Constitution does not protect uh, against a, a rogue insurrectionist president uh, I think is um, a, a big concept. And, and honestly, there's scholars on both sides of this issue. Uh, I, I think the court made a, a very thoughtful decision. Uh, and, you know, it's a judicial process. There are days to appeal. The petitioners could appeal, but Donald Trump could appeal also. He may not like being called an insurrectionist by this court and very well could file an appeal. Oh, well, that would be an interesting development, too. As you said, it sounds like reporting suggests the plaintiffs could appeal. We'll see what they do. There's reporting that this then, of course, would go potentially to the Supreme Court. The timeline of that we can't predict entirely here, you and I. But explain to us a little bit some of the deadlines in Colorado. I mean, what timeline would that need to proceed through to have an impact if they change the ruling? Well, petitioners or any party have three days to file an appeal. That appeal would go to the Colorado Supreme Court, and I, I believe the Colorado Supreme Court would act quickly. The certification for the presidential primary in the state of Colorado is January 5th. Uh, the district court who just decided the case we're talking about, that's the first court that this case has been in in the state of Colorado, really understood the urgency of just the, the election calendar and, and really pushed the trial quickly. Um, so there's plenty of time. But regardless if Trump is on the ballot or not, American voters have all the opportunity to save American democracy. They did it in 2018, 2020, 2022. And I, I do believe, whatever the outcome of this case is, that our democracy will be safe because Americans are good people and, and they know that we need to have a, a country where the rule of law is followed, where the U.S. Constitution is upheld, and that of the American people are respected. And democracy has very much mattered, to your point, in the last several elections. Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, I know you're going to very much be on the front lines of this. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening.